Hi there. Uh, yeah, so welcome. My name is Craig from Asia for Animals Coalition. I'm really happy to be moderating this session today. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, everyone's still kind of meeting this morning, getting to know each other. It's really good to see some uh, old faces and lots and lots of new faces here as well. Uh, this is why we're here, uh, to learn. Um, and we've got two great speakers for you today. I hope that you uh, take away a lot from this session on aquatic animals. Um, so we have uh, Lin Hung Trin from Shrimp Welfare Project today. And uh, Kartik Pulagurta from Fish Welfare Initiative. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about them in a second. But I just wanted to say uh, as an opening remark that, you know, this topic is really important. Uh, so many trillions of aquatic animals are affected in food systems worldwide and as animal people for us it's relatively easy for us to feel empathy for aquatic animals they're so different from us but it's not easy for everyone it's not easy to make everyone care so it's not there maybe aren't going to be public awareness interventions so we have to take lots of different uh streams, lots of different styles of interventions, and I'm hoping that we're going to hear some of that from uh, Kartik and Lin Hung today about what their approaches their organizations are taking. Um, hopefully you're going to hear about how your organization can get involved, or if you're not yet with an organization, maybe how you could start one, how you can take up new work, because this field uh, certainly needs uh, as many people working on it as, as is possible, really. Um, so, Lien Hung Trin is the Vietnam Program Coordinator of Shrimp Welfare Project since May 2022. She holds an MA in Human Rights from Central European University, Hungary, and a BA in Sociology from Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Uh, she has a decade of experience in international nonprofits and uh, research institutes in Singapore, Hungary, and Vietnam. And we also have Kartik Pulugurta, who has a background in animal welfare and ethical livelihoods. Um, he holds a master's degree in diplomacy, law, and business um, from the Jindal School of International Affairs. Um, and he is also a PhD scholar. Um, so, yeah, I think we have uh, Kartik's presentation first. Is that correct? So, uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, please give a, a round of applause for Kartik Pulagurta. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. I, I love everything about KL. Um, super nice city. Um, I'm not going to take too much time. I want to leave a lot of room for uh, you guys to interact with me, basically, because that's where I think most of, uh, you know, most of the questions can be answered and uh, we can get into deeper issues, basically. So with that said, I think I want to talk about one of the things that uh, we've discovered along the way, you know, how to create grassroots support for the work we're doing, how to kind of engage with uh, the system in a way that enables us to get this going from the ground up, right? So that's what I'm going to talk about. And um, we don't need to keep our conversation limited to what I'm showing here. There's more questions you could have. There's more questions you might have. I'm happy to answer any of them, right? Okay, let's get started. I think this is a very important thing to realize uh, from the get-go. What we know about fish is very little, right? Uh, what we know about their welfare, we're still discovering a lot of things. Uh, see, the thing about welfare is uh, there's a scientific angle to it. We understand how much dissolved oxygen is required uh, for each species, we are, we're starting to understand things like that. We understand what pH levels fish stay comfortable in. So there's a lot of technical details to this, but there's also another equation, which is what, what is happening at the association of, uh, I mean, at the intersection of humans and fish, basically, right? What are those components of neglect that are common in our farms? What are those components of... Uh, lack of technological intervention that are causing suffering, basically. So a lot of it lies at the intersection. A lot of doing welfare on the ground lies at the intersection. And that's what we're trying to discover as we go along. 
we're in the, at this very early stage where we know a few things and we don't know a few things, right? And uh, yeah, so the agenda is going to be talking about how we have like this, you know, how we have this robust engagement with farmers as a way of having an impact, but not just that, learning from them to have a deeper impact on a later day. And then we want to be, sorry, uh, we want to be developing, we want to be talking about how we're developing standards right now um, to, again, deepen the impact and how we go about doing that work. And then how are we building legitimacy to do our work on the ground, basically? What does that mean? All right. So I'll start with our robust engagement with farmers. You can see our colleagues there doing a training session for farmers, basically. Um, that's Jennifer right there, you can see. And that's our program coordinator, Chandu. And um, sorry, our uh, data collector, Chandu. And our data collectors are basically our ambassadors to the farmer. He's a farmer himself. He's taken up a lot of our interventions in his own farm. Um, he's a very enthusiastic participant in the welfare, fish welfare project, basically, right? So that's the kind of work we're getting into with, with the farmers. So what's important for that? Regular contact time to ensure that we understand the needs that they have on a regular basis. Again, as I said, a lot of the problems come at the intersection of um, the science and, you know, and the farmers themselves. What, what are they doing? What are they not doing, right? So this regular contact time helps us understand what the needs are, right? We're still figuring out some details. Um, I think we got a lot of details figured out for some stages of aquaculture, but we're still figuring out what these details are for other stages. Uh, there's a lot of scope open for earlier stages in aquaculture. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, ensuring that farmers are implementing our protocols well. This is an important detail for us. Um, our staff are almost regularly there when a farmer is implementing a welfare, uh, a, a, what we call, um, you know, what's part of our implementation strategy. If there's a dissolved oxygen problem in their farm uh, and we have an intervention for solving that, we're usually there to make sure that the next five days, we're there to oversee how they're solving that issue. We take regular water quality measurements during that stage of intervention, basically. Um, acquiring farmer support for further fish welfare research, right? Um, most of our participants, um, we, we have something called the Alliance for Responsible Aquaculture. Most of the participants in the Alliance help us do a lot, a lot of research, basically. Right now, we are conducting research into how changing feeding practices could be improving dissolved oxygen levels. That's something that we're looking into. And there's a lot of farmers who are participating to help us understand what this equation looks like. And that's, uh, again, that's a way of furthering this work um, from the ground up, right? And mediating with governments and corporations to kind of ensure that there is a future for all this, right? This is future-proofed to a large extent. Um, you know, if local governments can bring up ordinances to ensure that whatever, whatever standards we have are part of the law or part of what they're prescribing as well, that means that there is a permanence beyond FWI to a lot of what we're prescribing. So this way, we've been able to help 1.6 million fish, right? Um, we, as, I, as, as I said, this is both an impact-based and a research-based work that we're doing. We're learning at the same time from whatever we have learned, we've, we've kind of been implementing that as quickly as we learn these things. Um, then the next thing is about developing the standards for fish welfare. That's my colleague Vivek. Um, he's, again, teaching uh, some farmers how to do water quality analysis in their pond. So what does this mean? What, what it means is that we need to, we, there are some obvious welfare standards, you know? Um, we know some of the things connected to improving DO. We know some of the things connected to improving pH levels. But we don't know how to tackle 
issues of mortality in some life stages yet, right? We're still figuring out what those are, but then we can always take advantage of coming up with a good program for what's obvious. And that's what we do right now, right? We're developing and understanding how to build a good program around what is obvious. And then, we, and this also needs us to build that program for a certain probability for behavior change on the ground. For instance, we, have, we know for a fact that having them do what we call pond prep, like drying their pond out at the beginning of every cycle has a lot of impact on fish welfare. But a lot of farmers can't do it because they don't have access to water. Um, and that, that simply means that we can't build a project on that particular water quality, uh, um, you know, water quality intervention, basically. We have to build a pro program on something that works, something that they're willing to do, right? And we also need to, with these particular standards, find a pathway for scalability. It's not enough that we're able to do this with a few farms. We should be able to do it with a lot of farms. So finding those things that a lot of people can implement, a lot of people face problems with, a lot of, a lot of fish can experience better lives is very important to us. So that is, again, a very important factor for um, developing our standards, basically. Lastly, aiming to identify a, a way of having a deeper impact, basically. Now, what we're doing right now, we're not quite content with how much impact it's having in some cases, right? You know, some cases, the interventions last for a few weeks, and then after that, the situation can get back to normal. We're not content with that. We want to ensure that some of these things, um, you know, our interventions last quite a while, help a substantial portion of a fish's life, and ensure its well-being throughout. So with that said, that is the way in which we are aiming to develop our standards. And we're doing a lot of work towards this. Um, I'll talk about some of the future projects we have. But right now, what we're doing is we're trying to understand, we're trying to work, we're working with about 100 farmers, basically. And then we're trying to do work that is enabling us to understand from those systems uh, how to build this future wherein we can address all these components to develop the standards. All right, so lastly, I want to talk about building legitimacy on the ground, right? In India, there's a lot of scope for doing this sort of work. Um, as you can see, a lot, of our, a lot of work has been done to create an ecosystem within the legal infrastructure we have in the country uh, to enable this work. We have the Prevention of Cruelty Act, which is, uh, which is a visionary project for enabling better lives for animals in the country. We have recent judgments, as recently as 2021, um, which kind of showcase that judges in the country care about animals deeply and care about them in the right ways, as you can see. Not in some, oh, they're useful for our economy kind of a way, but then they care about the intrinsic um, you know, value and behavior of these animals. So with that said, fish still face a lot of discrimination in this particular segment. I'm sure that that's the same about shrimp and many other animals as well still. Um, a lot of the legal system recognizes fish uh, as an equivalent uh, entity to fruits and vegetables, and that's, a, that's an unfortunate reality of the country. But I think it's important to work that out of the system, work that out of the legal context that we have. So with that said, I think we want to ensure that we work with the right organizations. We're currently working with the, we're currently planning on working with the Central Institute for Freshwater Aquaculture to get them to endorse the work we're doing. I think a government entity like that, a prominent government entity like that, endorsing the work is gonna be an important step in the right direction. Another endorsement could come from the Veterinary Council of India recognizing fish sentience. Currently the veterinary um, the, the veterinary colleges in the country don't even have a subject to tackle the issue of fish diseases and um, issues that they face. And that's a big problem, right? Um, the, you know, a lot of medication is being prescribed to fish without 
proper uh, met, you know, proper people looking into that, proper people lo doing the research. So that's some of the work we're doing to build a sort of endorsement ecosystem. Um, another thing we're doing is we're advocating for policy change, especially at the state level. Each state has its own set of policies connected to agriculture. And if some of our standards get recognized by the state government, I think that would be hugely beneficial because that will enable a lot of people to recognize that fish welfare is being taken seriously by, an, by a prominent entity in the state. Um, we, can, we can work with the state government at that point. This is what a lot of organizations and nonprofits in India do. They work with those governments when laws exist to kind of get funds from the government. Uh, in India, because it's the type of country that it is, the government is the fish business as well in many cases. So we are internalizing the costs to the industry in this way. So if they have a policy, we can get them to allocate funds for it and have them be responsible um, towards the future we want to see. And lastly, pairing welfare with lo local government sustainability goals. Right? This is also an important, uh, currently they're unpaired. They don't see animal welfare as a legitimate way of uh, kind of reaching sustainability goals. But you know, we, we want to show them differently. And this will mean some investment towards research, some partnerships with universities. And that's something that we're doing. We are already partnered with the university to produce research uh, in this fashion. So once we're able to pair welfare with the government's sustainability goals, Again, there's a lot of money to, you know, kind of internalize a lot of, co a lot of the costs for doing this good work, basically. And uh, I want to end by talking a little bit about what we're likely to do in the future, basically. Um, we want to be enabling livelihoods organizations. There's organizations like the Tata Trust, which have a huge impact on how aquaculture is done right now. Um, and most of these livelihood NGOs or nonprofits control many thousands of uh, acres of fish farms, right? They, they literally are expanding the scope of aquaculture in the country. If we can get to them and get them to improve the lives of fish, if we, if we get to improve the lives of fish through them, and also have them not take on aquaculture projects unnecessarily, you know, like in areas where that sort of a thing can be a net negative as opposed to doing anything good, I think that would, that would work really well. So we want to coordinate with um, some of these livelihoods organizations. We're working with one named Dwara right now, and I see a huge scope for this kind of work. Um, Government-supported labs. Uh, a lot of uh, fish farmers don't realize that they need to get regular water quality checks to ensure the health of their fish and well-being. Now, there is a scheme already that the government offers, but that's not utilized sufficiently. There's money allocated here, there's a scheme. We want to ensure that these government-sponsored labs exist in greater numbers, so that fish farmers are taking care of their fish better. They have access to um, you know, regularly checking water quality in the ponds and improving the lives of fish through that information. Um, and lastly, but not least, we're looking into earlier life stages. We could be talking billions and even trillions of fish here. Um, and in a very, very small radius, basically. In Andhra Pradesh, where I work, in a few villages um, which are dedicated to farming earlier life stages, basically rearing, I would like to say, earlier life stages of the fish, um, they have you know, they control the lives of huge numbers of fish, but the problem is there are heavy mortalities in these systems. If we can find a way to ensure that these guys are doing better by their fish, that means we'd be impacting so many lives. Uh, so this is something we're looking into. We don't have good ways of doing this just yet, but we definitely want to find good ways of doing this. So that's uh, all I have for now, but I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions you guys have. I want to continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kartik Pulugurta. Um, I just wanted to say before we bring up the next speaker that I forgot to mention that we will be taking questions. I'll be reading out questions from the Whova app. So please uh, 
put your questions in the app. Uh, you can also upvote the questions of others in the room, and I can read out the popular ones. Um, but next, we'll move on, and we'll uh, give a warm welcome to Lin Hung Trin from Shrimp Welfare Project. So, Lin Hung, a round of applause, please. Thank you, Craig. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm very grateful that this morning our keynote speaker gave such a lot of spotlight for fish and shrimp, and so we received a lot of you today in this room. Very thankful for that. Um, sorry, uh, the audio team, can you change to the speaker view for me, please? Um, yep, so uh, yeah, my name is Lian Hương, and I'm the Vietnam Program Coordinator for Shrimp Welfare Project. I'm based in Ho Chi Minh City, and um, very happy today to share with you some kind of overview about key concerns in shrimp welfare and also an overview of our work in different countries. Um, so just a quick uh, introduction about uh, shrimp welfare project. We, okay, we are the first um, organization focused exclu exclusively on this cause area, shrimp welfare, and uh, in particular farm shrimps. And uh, we are a UK-based organization but we have staff um, working in different countries. And today I'll cover six topics. Um, I'll try to be quick, because a lot of them. Um, I'll highlight key shrimp welfare concerns, and then I'll move on to um, scale neglectedness and tractability, the reason why we chose this um, issue um, for our work. And also I'll talk about our global approaches, um, our activities and challenges, um, as well as how you can get involved, which is very important. So the first um, part of my presentation, stream welfare concerns. So I'll, I'll begin with the question that I get asked the most, are shrimps sentient? So by sentience, um, we mean the ability to, f to feel pain and to, to feel joy, to feel pain, even warmth, pleasure, um, and this is different from the ability to think, and um, yeah, and so you can ask yourself a very simple question, does it feel like something to be in this individual? And the answer is that um, this um, sentience in shrimps has been proved uh, in different research, you know, like um, back in 2005, uh, the European Food Safety Authority has already published a report, and it says that there are scientific evidence um, indicating that um, decapods and cephalopods um, are able to experience pain and distress. And more recently, um, in 2021, a group of researchers from London School of Economics and Political Science has published a very important report, and they recommended that all cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans be regarded as sentient. And based on this report published by LSE, uh, the UK has passed into law a very important legislation, the Animal Welfare Sanctions Act in April 2022. And SHRIMS uh, sanctions has been recognized. Um, and in this legislation, you can also find examples in um, other European countries. And so the answer for sh SHRIMS sanctions is very clear here. And this brings me to the key concerns uh, regarding shrimp welfare. The first one is um, obviously water quality because, you know, key parameters like dissolved oxygen, pH level, salinity, temperature are all important to the welfare of all aquatic animals, uh, including fish and shrimps. And um, poor water quality can lead to, you know, um, com compromised immune system in shrimps and even suffocation and death. And um, stocking density is a very uh, important um, aspect regarding shrimp um, welfare. Just to be clear, the footage that you, the photo that you see on my slide is not, was not taken from a farm. It was taken by one of our team members um, from an industry event. Shrimps were on display, but it gave us a, quite a good small scale visual of, of um, the issue of stocking density that we're trying to highlight here. So there is strong experimental evidence to suggest that um, reductions in stocking density can improve um, stream effect indirectly by improving water quality, reducing disease and stress, and increasing uh, survival rate. Um, yep, and you can see because shrimps are bottom dwellers, so they don't, when you hear farmers talking about how many shrimps per um, cubic meter, 
that's actually not very, uh, doesn't reflect um, the shrimp's um, natural behavior, they are bottom dwellers. So if, if we, we talk about stocking density, we talk about square meter, meaning that if it's, not, if it's too much, then shrimp will just laying on top of each other, as you can see in this picture. Um, yep, I'm sorry for the very distressing image. Um, so the next issue that is pretty well known uh, regarding shrimp welfare um, concern is uh, eye stock ablation. So basically there's this very common practice um, among hatcheries and producers all around the world um, that they uh, cut one eye stock of female shrimps uh, to induce spawning and um, yeah, sexual maturation among the shrimps. And this, of course, causes a lot of pain, stress, and um, high mortality uh, levels. And there have been um, a research, a very important research published um, by a researcher at the University of Stirling pointing out that um, this practice is actually not sustainable um, in the long term because um, the offsprings born from um, shrimps that were ablated uh, less susceptible to um, stress and diseases than those who were born from female shrimps who are not ablated. Um, diseases, um, this is a concern not, among, not just among the shrimp welfare advocates, but also among the farmers, because diseases obviously kill a lot of shrimps. And um, health and mortality, and also it is very detrimental. Um, it can cause less spillover in common uh, water bodies and um, and because disease is becoming more and more an issue in the stream industry, farmers have turned to antibiotics as a way to control diseases. And then in the long term, this in turn promotes the emergence of antibiotic resistance uh, bacteria. So this is a serious public health concern as well. Um, sorry for this stressing image again. This was taken in India in one of um, our trips to India for our scoping work. Um, so stunning and slaughter. So Shrimps obviously didn't live a very pleasant life in the farm, but when they die, they also die mostly in a very painful way. That is the current situation that we've found. Um, they're typically slaughtered by um, either asphyxiation, which means suff um, suffocation. They're taken out of water, being weighed, um, sometimes living under the sun for a couple of minutes or an hour before um, they are put into in turn an eye slurry and die, um, prolonged death, or they're crushed by the weight of other shrimps, as you can see in this basket. Um, so the industry, sometimes they argue that this, is effect, this has effectively stunned the shrimps before they die um, using eye slurry, but in fact it is actually just a practice to, to maintain their freshness instead of uh, to kill them um, humanely. Right, so um, I've highlighted the key concerns regarding shrimp welfare. So um, for this uh, part of my presentation, I'm going to explain why we as an organization chose to work on shrimp welfare as a cause um, area exclusively. The reason is because of its scale, neglectedness, and tractability. Um, sorry again for a very distressing image. Um, so according to a, a report published by Rethink uh, Priorities back in 2020, um, around 230 billion shrimps are living on farms at any moment. This is a huge number. And around 26 trillion shrimps are slaughtered for human, for human consumption annually. This includes both um, shrimps that are farmed and also those who are caught in the wild. And although um, they are farmed, killed, um, consume in large numbers, um, they have not received a lot of attention. But fortunately, in the recent years, um, thanks to the work of these organizations that I've listed um, on my slide, um, it has, um, the cause has started to receive um, more attention. Um, especially thank, thank you, um, our colleagues from Fish Welfare Initiative, in your work to support farmers, um, polyculture farmers. You also help the shrimps, like about a million shrimps have been helped in India. Um, yeah, you can other organizations have also um, brought um, the issue to the table. And uh, of course, um, very important research which has inspired um, the creation of our organization. It is very tractable because once it has received adequate resources, it can be solved uh, effectively. Um, 
the industry, it has ring the, the bell uh, in, the, in the industry. We have found that, for example, big retailers like CP Food, they have already made a commitment to, to stop the practice of eye stock operation in their supply chain. Um, there's still a long, long way to go with the industry, but this is a good sign that they have started to pay attention to the issue and do something about it. Um, the issue has also been featured in various industry uh, media channels. So um, now you may ask, like, so what are Stream Welfare Project doing um, to, uh, to address these issues? Um, so um, just want to give you a brief overview about our global approaches. We have four key areas of activities. Number one is corporate engagement. A very important part of our corporate engagement work is the Humane Slaughter Initiative. So for this uh, program, we try to um, make agreements with producers who are committed to um, to stun their shrimps like humanely for at least 100 million shrimps per year. Um, and we will provide them with the equipment to, to use in their farms to stun the shrimps before they are killed. Uh, we also talk to corporates to get them to commit to improve other areas uh, regarding shrimp welfare like water quality or stocking density. Um, the second um, area of our work is um, farmer support, uh, similar to um, what Fish Welfare um, Initiative is doing in India. We're also doing the same uh, line of work in India. We created a platform for farmers where we provide them with technical support and um, it's also a channel for them to exchange knowledge, to initiate collaborations. We also provide technicians to visit um, the farms and provide consultation, uh, both on site and also through online platforms. Um, Research, because stream welfare is such a new topic, there has not much research done about this topic, and so we actively uh, conduct or um, sponsor or collaborate with other organizations to do more research, to understand more about the uncertainties um, regarding this issue. And lastly, raising issue resilience. We, you know, this is just to raise awareness about this issue the more the better. We have been doing this by attending conferences, not just within the animal advocacy movement, but also on industry platforms. Um, th also through podcasts, through articles, we try to get published in industry magazines, etc. Just to get the shrimps um, to have more attention about how they live in the farms. Um, so far, I'm going to be just be quickly go through this, what we have achieved so far. We, um, for Vietnam, uh, in the photo is me and um, Andres, my colleague, uh, our CEO. Um, so this was taken during our scoping trip to uh, the Mekong Delta last year. Uh, so during this scoping trip, we kind of assessed the situation of stream welfare in Vietnam and identify the areas for intervention um, suitable to our context. Um, we have also secured an MOU with Sofina UK and Taika, they are producer in Vietnam, and we will provide Taika with uh, stunning equipment. Um, and this will be used for 4,000 metric tons of Vaname shrimps per year, equivalent to 270 million shrimps per year. Um, a lot of outreach, um, like we get published on uh, industry magazines, which we are very proud of. Uh, we're also collaborating with a local university to conduct a research on welfare gap in um, aquaculture technician training in Vietnam. India, similarly, we conducted a scope and report in collaboration with our colleagues in, uh, from FIAPO. Uh, also conducted a pilot study on the relationship between stocking density and um, risk management and the investment and profits for farmers. Um, SSFI is the platform that I've mentioned, uh, Sustainable um, Shrimp Farmers of India. Um, and through this platform, we have directly helped 120,000 shrimps and indirectly helped 900,000 shrimps through online consultation. Um, and a couple of important MOUs that we have secured in Gujarat. Corporate engagement, this is my favorite topic, uh, my fa our favorite um, activities because um, of its um, cost effectiveness, and we can help a lot of um, huge number of shrimps. So, in addition to the MOU that we have secured in Vietnam, we have also managed to um, secure agreements with producers in Honduras and Latin America. 
huge number of firms um, will be um, kill, uh, humanely through this uh, initiative. And we've also um, signed an MOU with Optima, a Norwegian uh, producer of stunners, uh, to use uh, for our partners in different parts of the, uh, of the world. We're also part of the technical, shrimp technical working group um, of ASC, which is the uh, biggest, one of the biggest um, seafood certifiers to develop shrimp welfare standards to be implemented in the near future. Um, this, you might have seen this photo this morning from Dave. Um, we are part of many coalitions in Asia and Europe. Um, we just need help, we just need to uh, work with different organizations to, to bring shrimp issue more to the table. Um, yeah, and a couple of important research that we have done, we've published, you can check it out on our website. And um, yeah, this is unrest again. Uh, we're going to conferences, industry events, animal welfare events. Um, very importantly, um, last September, yeah, just last month, the first time, we were very proud of the first, for the very first time, shrimp welfare has been discussed in a designated session during the Global Shrimp um, Forum in the Netherlands, which is a high profile um, industry event. Our challenges, um, this is coming to, an end of, to the end of my presentation, we've encountered a lot of challenges in implementing our work. Um, there's been very limited awareness on the issue, so the industry has not received sufficient pressure from consumers, you know, compared to the chicken industry. And so we have to shift our work approach a bit because of this. And um, also, shrimp industry is a very fragmented industry, so it is very hard to implement something that is industry-wide. Um, we have to work with different stakeholders, um, and connect them. Um, also, not much research has been done on the topic, and it is a very high-stake industry. Farmers invest a lot of uh, capital in this. The risk is high because of diseases, because of climate change, because of environmental issues. So, shrimp farmers are even more resistant to change than um, other uh, industries. Um, yeah, and. Um, in general, it's a trend in the shrimp industry to intensify, and we've seen this as a threat. And um, and so our work regarding stocking density is kind of going against the, the trend that the industry is trying to move, and um, that is a major challenge. And finally, it is very hard to intervene in major production countries that do not have any link to welfare favorable, favorable markets. For example, China. Um, Lots of shrimps are produced there, but they're mostly consumed and sold to the domestic market. And it is very hard for an organization like us to work with the important export market um, supply chain to intervene in a um, country like, like China. Um, country specific, uh, in India, we have recognized, we've seen, we've noticed that it is relatively easy to, to sign MOUs with stakeholders, but in order to turn that into action, uh, there can be a lot of um, problems, uh, it will take a lot of time. Um, also, farmers in India, shrimp farmers, they tend to have this gambling mindset. They tend to stock without considering the carrying capacity of their pond, of their farms. And um, yeah, moving on to Southeast Asia, which is where I am based, and um, we've traveled to a couple of other Southeast Asian countries to do scoping work, and we've uh, realized that um, the industry in Southeast Asia is very well established which makes them um, highly resistant to change. And um, the cost for technical support in terms of manpower, equipment, and transportation is very high. Um, also in Vietnam, um, we've noticed um, some gender biases and superstitious beliefs, which made it even difficult to access the farms and to visit them in the first place, and not to mention like to collaborate and to be in the farm with them um, in the long term. So how you can get involved, um, you can check out the work with us section on our website if you want to volunteer. Sometimes we also open up new positions, so check it out. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to receive the latest news, and of course you can also donate to us. Um, yep, uh, these are the, some of the important resources that I want to highlight. You can check them out. Some are published by us, some um, by other organizations. Um, very important if you want to learn more about the cause.
yeah, this is my contact information if you want to get in touch and chat more about shrimps. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lin Hen. Um, do we have more microphones for the Q&A session? Yeah? Yeah. Let's uh, get Lin Hung and uh, Kartik back up here and we'll, we'll have a microphone each if possible. Uh, so yeah, before we get into the q and I just wanted to mention something following on from what Lian Hung uh, ended on there. If your organization is interested in working on aquatic animal uh, welfare or advocacy and you're not yet doing that, then uh, you'll find, if you go to ali.fish, uh, you'll find the Aquatic Animal Alliance, which FWI and SWP are both a member of, and it's really easy and very effective mechanism for uh, getting involved in that kind of advocacy and uh, the Alliance is actually having some good success. So thanks uh, for mentioning that. Um, and I'm just gonna uh, open up the first questions here from Huva. so thanks to the audience for putting them in here. So this question is actually for Kartik at uh, FWI, but actually it's really good, so I wanna ask it to both of you. Um, it, the question is asking, have you been able to assess the perceptions of fish farmers or their knowledge of fish uh, sentience, social, social, emotional, and cognitive uh, capacities. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear from both of you on that. Right. Yeah, I think uh, in when we, I've done a lot of farm visits and it's very evident that farmers understand more than most people do about this stuff. Um, for instance, a lot of farmers will tell, tell me that the fish know exactly who's feeding them. They know them by how they move, they know them by the sounds they make, basically. So they don't come to the surface or to the dikes, basically, unless it's that person who's approaching them. Um, not just that, they also see them as delicate animals. Um, they also see them as beautiful animals. But alas, all this doesn't translate into uh, sufficient care for them uh, because a lot of fish farmers are in many ways unaware of uh, how they could help their fish in certain circumstances. Um, they have a lot of unhelpful people helping them in these situations. For instance, if a fish, uh, if they see a few fish dying, they're immediate, they're likely to get help from these local shops, which are not, prof I mean, which are not really any experts in the area, they'll just go to the local shop, they'll show them a dead fish, and they'll say, give me something for this. And these are not experts, they're not educated uh, to, to offer good solutions in these areas, so they often get bad help. Um, so that's, that's the other side of that problem. But there is a clear resonance um, between the animals and the farmer and this is not present in others. I mean, I've spoken to some government officials who said absolute garbage regarding sentience and uh, knowledge about their fish, and they're supposed to be like high-level officials in the fisheries department. They know very little about uh, uh, the fish, basically. But the farmers recognize a lot more, recognize their capacity to be uh, sentient. Um, but you know, we, we need to connect that with larger issues. Thanks. So, for the case of shrimps, we notice a difference. Uh, we notice a difference uh, among the perception of farmers in India and Vietnam, uh, the two main countries of our operation currently. In India, we found that 90% of farmers that we have interviewed um, thought that the shrimps are sentient. They can feel pain. They, yeah, they they think that sh shrimps can feel something. Whereas in Vietnam, we included a similar question in our scoping survey for the farmers. And soon we realized that we shouldn't include that question. I, we shouldn't ask it to the farmers, obviously. Um, during some conversation that I had, um, just when I contacted the farmers, I feel that they, many of them took the uh, idea of shrimp welfare or like shrimp's ability to feel something um, as not serious or it's like, it's, they just don't believe it and they think it's kind of ridiculous. And, um, on the other hand, a lot of, um, you know, like manage, at management level for, for corporate producers, they are aware that in import markets like in the UK or in the EU, consumers and buyers have already um, paid attention to the issue of shrimp welfare and shrimp sentience. They are aware of that, but um, I think they're not 
um, hundred percent convinced. Uh, but they just follow because uh, it is a requirement from the import market from their buyers. Um, but yeah, I, I think the perception between the two for farmers and producers in the two countries there's a difference. Yeah, so there's a real diversity in uh, in those perceptions. Um, thank you both for that. So the next question, which I believe is coming from Anbu, is um, uh, for you, Kartik. I liked your point on pairing welfare with uh, government sustainability goals. Uh, do you have any specific insights on when the government or agri-sector opts for closed containment systems to address eco-threats, but it affects welfare? And she gives the example uh, in Singapore to increase productivity and meet 30% of the nutritional, nutritional needs within country by 2030. Um, as far as India is concerned, I think I, there is a good solution here, but I'm not sure if this solution can apply to other countries. Uh, quite simply put, um, a lot of sustainability initiatives in the country have looked to traditional values and traditional ways of doing things. And, you know, that is a good thing for us, right? I mean, traditional systems are for aquaculture, the stocking densities are considerably lower. Uh, and uh, the, I mean, like, we, they're not perfect systems, but we can work with them a lot more easily. We can produce welfare in those systems a lot more easily than we can in, we can in, like, non-traditional systems, basically. Um, Semi-intensive systems, which have become, become more common in the country, I think it's harder to work with them on the welfare issue. So probably I see a solution, an India-specific solution here uh, for pairing those sustainability goals, but I don't know if that would work in other parts of Asia really all that well. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, and another question here, uh, for both of you, actually, um, and maybe we'll begin with Lian Hung. Um, are there any innovative approaches or technologies being developed to improve the welfare and rights of aquatic animals in industries such as aquaculture or research? So I've mentioned uh, as part of my presentation about this stunning equipment. Uh, for, for fish, um, the stunning, stunning machine has been uh, produced and developed for, I think, more than a decade. But for shrimp, this is a new innovation um, for electrical stunner. And then, um, to my understanding, there is another company that is, has just launched an in-water stunner, um, which means that the shrimp can be stunned inside the water. So shrimps, if you take them out of the water, very likely that they will feel stressed. And so um, I think this is a new development in terms of technology. Another um, development that I have noticed, but I'm not sure if this is uh, moving uh, in the positive direction uh, for shrimp welfare, which is some AI-based um, solution um, to monitor the water quality. Um, this has been launched by um, some uh, startups in, in Vietnam, in Southeast Asia, and the producers of these, uh, the developers of these um, solutions, um, they, they claim that this helped farmers to manage the water quality better. Um, I totally agree with that, but then on the other hand, we've also noticed that with the introduction of these um, AI-based um, water quality monitoring device and solution, farmers can also stock more shrimps. And this is not a very good news um, for, for welfare of the animals. So, yeah. Thanks. And Karti, anything on technologies? Yeah, I think there are a few technological aspects, but I, you know, I mean, just to give a couple of them, um, Nano bubble aerators could be really helpful for hatcheries uh, to maintain better welfare standards there uh, without, I mean, without increasing uh, their carrying capacity, essentially. They already use a variant of it that's not very effective. It's kind of like home, homemade uh, version of it. But I think some technologies can have a lot of uh, impact on welfare positively. But I would say more than technology, I would look to kind of going back to older practices. For instance, in the same hatcheries that I was talking about, people have gotten used to breeding these fish seven or eight times a year, basically. And the progeny uh, that comes from that kind of practice is far less likely to uh, succeed in the later stages of its life. Um, 
you know, they're more prone to diseases and stuff. Reducing those, uh, reducing those breeding numbers and like having, you know, a, a, a pair breed only once a year or twice a year is likely to be the kind of innovation or, I mean, a traditional um, method being brought back again is likely to, be, likely to be the case where the solutions are, honestly speaking, in case of fish welfare. And do you find that in those types of scenarios where you're essentially, because like that example or stocking density, you're trying to convince a farmer to reduce his output because it's, it makes more business sense, right? Because you'll get lower mortality and stuff. Is that quite challenging to do that type of advocacy when you're essentially asking to produce less? I think there are win-win situations in many of these cases. For instance, the rest of the industry wants, um, you know, uh, wants young fish that are capable of living uh, a more, I mean, living a better life basically in their system once they come to their system. For instance, if we were to take take some of this back, right? Um, those those young fish are likely to be more valuable for that farmer. Um, and because they maintain fewer number of bre breeding fish uh, anyway, I think doing this sort of a thing can be not very costly on the input side of things, but fairly rewarding on the output side of things. So there are win-win solutions here, um, but the, uh, the thing is they will need to be stressed on um, by organizations like ourselves, um, you know, initial investments will have to be made into making these changes, and then those models will have to be shown to the government to get them to take it seriously. Uh, I certainly believe that that's the kind of recipe we need to move the needle forward on this. Um, you don't face a lot of resistance when you're working in small numbers, but when you start scaling, um, it's likely that you will start seeing resistance, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And that makes me think of a, I'm selfishly going to hog with my own question here, is that uh, it made me think that, you know, a common thing about both your organizations is that both have, has the word welfare in the title. Lian Hung mentioned that in Vietnam, shrimp welfare is kind of thought of as potentially a ridiculous idea. So do you think that uh, challenges your, like your ability to scale to, you know, large scale work because of this, having it in the title there? You want to say something? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can take this question first. So um, initially, we were concerned that this we have this uh, name um, in our name of organization can make our work harder in Vietnam, but then we realized that um, it is not impossible. So um, at the beginning, when we approached uh, the first few stakeholders in the industry, what we did was we had to tie it um, with other. Um, issues of concern for the industry, for example, sustainability is like an umbrella that, that the word has been used so commonly and the industry has been talking about it for, for many years. And so, you know, when we talk about diseases in, in, in trim crops and um, the use of antibiotics and then treatment of effluent water before discharging them into the common water bodies, these are all like environmental issues and also tied to uh, shrimp welfare. And so we combine um, our agenda, our welfare agenda with other, you know, like sustainability agendas. And um, the second thing that works on our side is the, like what I've mentioned, there's been a requirement from, you know, their buyers in the UK because of the um, Animals uh, Sanctions Act that was passed last year. So even though producers, um, corporates in Vietnam are not 100% um, agree with, with uh, you know, like uh, the welfare agenda, they still do it and uh, give it a second thought because simply their buyers are requiring it. So, yeah, that's how we, we go about it in Vietnam. There, there are no perches just yet in India, um, but I'm confident that they can be found. Um, I mean, we have to take it one step at a time right now, but then I think we can find ways to... Uh, kind of find purchase as we scale up, basically. Because we have a lot of traditions that hearken to a lot of stuff. In, we, in fact, have a fish god uh, to start with. Uh, the messaging will, around this will have to be developed to a point where we can find purchase for this. But I think it's going to be super tough. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's a, a really nice point to end on is that, as we said at the start, this is a, quite a new field of work. So we've been really lucky to have Kartik Pulagurta and Lian Hung Trin, who are 
you know, in organizations that are really at the forefront of this. So please keep in touch with them, meet them in the lobby over lunch, what have you. Um, we'll close now to keep you on time for your next sessions. And I'd like to invite a final round of applause for Kartik and for Lin Hung. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>